Let's go to the book of Hebrews, chapter 12. And it is our custom to standing for the reading of God's word. So you see some people start popping up. Hebrews, Hebrews, James, book of Hebrews. I'm in a series for this whole month called Branded. And I just really want us to understand our identity and how God has marked us. And the first thing that I talked about last week is how God marks us by purifying us and setting us apart. And how many know God doesn't set us apart just so we can be set apart. He sets us apart so we can be used, so we can be a demonstration of his power and his presence today. And, and today I'm going to be talking from the book of Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18. And uh, if you got it, say, I've got it. Mm -hmm. If you don't got it, say, hold on. Mm -hmm. Nobody holding today. Praise the Lord. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18. You have not come to a physical mountain, to a place of flaming fire, darkness, gloom, and whirlwind, as the Israelites did at Mount Sinai. For they heard an awesome trumpet blast and a voice so terrible that they begged God to stop speaking. They staggered back under God's command. Even an animal t touches the, it, God says, even if an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. Moses himself was so frightened at the sight that he said, I am terrified and trembled. The writer of Hebrews says, no. Everybody say no. No, you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to countless thousands of angels in joyful gathering. You've come to the assembly of God's firstborn children whose names are written in heaven. You've come to God himself who is the judge over all things. You've come to the spirits of the righteous ones in heaven who have now been made perfect. You have come to Jesus, the one who mediates the new covenant between God and and people, and to the sprinkled blood, which speaks of forgiveness instead of crying out for vengeance, like the blood of Abel. Be careful that you do not refuse to listen to the one who is speaking. For the people of Israel did not escape when they refused to listen to Moses, the earthly messenger. We will certainly not escape if we reject the one who speaks to us from heaven. And when God spoke from Mount Sinai, his voice shook the earth. But now he makes another promise. Once again, I will shake not only the earth, but the heavens also. This means that all of creation will be shaken, removed, so that only unshakable things will remain. And since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshiping, worshiping him with holy fear and awe, for our God is a devouring, or in some contexts, consuming fire. Amen? Bow your heads with me. Have your way, Holy Ghost. We need a precious, we need your precious presence. God, one more time, would you just anoint me to be able to speak to your people and, and God, anoint the audience in this room and those that are watching all across the world. God, that they don't only be just hearers of the word, but doers. And God, for every person that doesn't know you, God, I pray today you would reveal to them that you are the Christ, the Son of God, in Jesus' name. And everybody says... Come on, you can be seated in the house. Amen. Just turn to your neighbor and say, you look good this morning. Come on, tell your other neighbor say, you look a little bit better. Yeah, you should have picked the right one. You should have picked the right one. Some of y'all didn't even look at nobody. <laughs> you, just, you just looked. <laughs> ah, today I want to just talk to you for just a minute about uh, the firstborn identity. And today, as, we, as I begin to break down this text, this text is not necessarily uh, an easy text, but it kind of reminds me of how important it is. If, if we could only live backwards, wouldn't our life be so much easier? If we could have seen our life and all of the choices and, and where we would end up, it would probably change our trajectory. You know how it is when you've gone and seen a movie and, and you've uh, seen the sequel and not the prequel. And, and then as you go backwards, how everything and the nuance of everything shapes your understanding. All of the drama and all the music and all of the bends and turns really don't move you because you know how the story ends. <laughs> In fact, there are many times when my wife and I are watching a movie, I tend to mute the movie, when it starts creating that drama. I just don't like to get all pinned up in needles when nothing's going to happen. Can I get a witness? 
And when you know how the movie ends, it silences the drama. It silences the conversation. It changes everything. And, and it's important today because it's what we don't know that hinders our walk. It's what we don't know that hinders our walk. And this is going to be a year of great growth. And this is going to be a year of great understanding. And so today as I take on this text, it's, this text is really about understanding who we are and whose we are so we can walk out God's promise for our lives. How many know God's got a promise for you? And so when we look at the book of Hebrews chapter 12 and we see the text, the text is really a comparative contrast of two mountains, Mount Sinai, where Mount Sinai is where they received the law through Moses and they begin to experience an, a, an unmediated God, a God that was on full-blown blast of his glory and his holy. How many know that when the people of God met, uh, God met, met the Lord at Mount Sinai, there was great fear? Great trembling, great, great uh, uh, trepidation when it comes to their experience with God. Because anytime you're unrighteous and you meet a holy God, you come in fear. And so in the story, the Bible tells us that they didn't even want to even hear the voice uh, of God. They, they shrouded against the voice of God. And in that context, they received the law. And all the law did is remind us of our unrighteousness. The writer of Hebrews tells us, you're not going to this place. This is a place of judgment, but now you have been washed with, with the precious blood, and now you've come into Mount Zion, a place of joy, a place of celebration, a place of the angels, a place uh, where, where God is seated amongst the, the people of God, and he identifies the people of God as the people of the firstborn church. How many know God has called you to be the people of the firstborn? And in that, the Bible says that there is a word that is spoken, and the word that is spoken is from the blood, and the blood speaks of a better covenant over your life. And I'm so thankful today that I'm not under the law, but I am under the blood, because when the law is brought up, I am condemned, but the blood speaks that I have been cleansed. The blood speaks that therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Jesus, the blood speaks for me and it speaks for you. Mm -hmm. Tell your neighbor, say the blood speaks. The blood speaks and when it speaks, it speaks of who we are as children of God. And, and Paul then, uh, not Paul, he, we don't know who the writer necessarily is, but he begins to tell him that, that because of that, he says, I want you to make sure that you heed the voice of God. That you begin to live into and up to the call of whose you are. And what do I mean by that? When the, the pretext of the verse is very important because it, it sets up the narrative of this story. It is a, he says um, in, in verse Hebrews chapter 12, make sure that no one is immoral or godless like Esau who traded his birthright, just underlined, as the firstborn son for a single meal. You know that afterwards when he wanted his father's blessing, he was rejected. It was too late for repentance, even though he begged with many tears, with bitter tears. And, 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 and today, I, I've come to talk to you for just a few minutes about how God has called you to be the firstborn, but you're still acting like Esau. You're still acting like Esau. Esau was the firstborn, but he didn't know he was the firstborn. And because of that, he acted more like a slave than a son. And today, the reason why people are not moved by our faith is because we've not given them any distinction. It's not about how we behave. It's about how we become. How many know that, that this, this faith that we're living is not a Sunday morning only experience? Talk to me, somebody. How many know this faith is something we have to live in day in and day out? How many know we're supposed to be growing in our walk with God? We're supposed to be building out, and this is a year of discipline. And for us to be disciplined, we've got to identify some things that are in us that are not of him. And so the Esau syndrome, I want you to write this down. It says when you live for the present and not for the promise. No problem with Esau was that Esau lived from the present. Everything, everything in his situation defined his choices. 
And there are a lot of people in this room who live by their situation instead of their revelation. Mm -hmm. There is people in here, when I talk about revelation, I'm talking about the revelation of who God is and what he's called us to become. I'm talking about that God has a promise over my life, that God has a promise. He has an expected end, and so I've got to live with the end in mind. And so when we look at the text in the book of Genesis, chapter 25, verse 29, you just write that down. Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished, and he said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. That is why he was called Edom. Edom means red. And Jacob replied, first sell me your birthright. He said, look, I'm about to die. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath and sold the birthright to Jacob. And when we see this, this dynamic, we think, why in the world would Esau live in that kind of context? Why would he sell his brother? This is the reason. Because when you are Esau, you live out of convenience instead of covenant. You live out of convenience. Everything is about your comfort. Everything is about your need. Everything is about what you're going through. You make everything that you have is about convenient. We live in a world, even in the church, where everybody wants to be comforted. Everybody, we want night, we want nice air conditioning when it's hot. We we want we want we want padded pews or padded chairs. We want everybody to serve us. I mean, yesterday, the, 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 uh, the Chiefs were playing the Dolphins at negative 2 degrees. There were 70,000 fans. You, we had a blizzard and asked 70,000. You would have three. Y'all not going to keep it real today. I watch you online, Pastor. Amen. But how many of you know that, that it's my job as a pastor to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable? And my challenge to you today is that you stop living out of convenience and you start living under a covenant of commitment that this is who I am and this is who, and I'm tied to God and God is tied to me and I make my decision not based on what's convenient, but wait, what, what is based on covenant. Because when you are not spiritually fed, you are emotionally led. There are people in this room, just, just leave me. Leave me be. When you are not spiritually fed, you are emotionally led. How many people in this room understand that it, 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 your feelings are, have become the dictators of your destiny? How many people in this room have I seen who have allowed their feelings to become their dictators instead of indicators? How many people in this room have, are dealing with feelings of inadequacy or feelings of, of insignificance or feelings of, of fear? How many know everybody in this room has got real feelings? I'm not denying your feelings. I'm just trying to tell you you can't live by your feelings. If you live by your feelings, you'll be happy one day and you'll be a mess the next day. That's why you're all joy, joy, joy on Friday and on Monday. You're grumpy, grumpy, grumpy because you live based on your situation. But God wants you to understand today it's time for you to grow up and allow God to shape you. No, this is going to be the year that I'm not going to let my feelings feelings dictate my faith today I'm not gonna let my fear of what I can't do become the barrier but this is gonna be the year that I grow through some things just tell your neighbors I'm gonna grow through some things today mm -hmm. and I'm going to become a covenant person I'm going to allow myself to grow I'm not gonna let fear become the the barrier to stepping out into the unknown but that's how many people in this room, they live by, by comfort. I'm just afraid I'm going to fail. I'm just going, I'm afraid I'm going to be rejected. Well, can I tell you today that Steph Curry, his, his average is 47.4 for shooting. He makes, I don't know how much money, the brother makes like $30 million a year to only make it one out of every two times. Hello, hello, I wish I could make $30 million just by preaching one good message out of two. 
Can I get a witness? You know what I'm saying? I, I, Amazon man just got pulled up. <laughs> we paying you. You just got to get 50% of the packages. Some of y'all maybe just got 50%, but how many people know that's a low average? But the, uh, the, the dynamic is that every time, uh, and, and I know there's other people like Michael Jordan. Anybody Michael Jordan fan? Come on, give me a holler. You know, I, that's my era, Michael Jordan. And he, was, he was a little bit better than Steph Curry. He shot 49%. And if you're a little bit older than that, you got Larry Bird. Come on, I had to put it out there. I'm a Hoosier by nature. Come on now. <laughs> and then you can go all the way back to Dr. J. He shot like 53%. But at the end of the day, the reason why they pay him is because they, they're not shooting. They, they're not paying him just to shoot. They're paying him because he has the confidence that if I miss the shot, I can keep on shooting because I'm going to practice and perform in a place that I'm going to grow and I'm going to work. And I'm not afraid to miss because I know the next one's going to go in. And if you give me the ball, I'm not afraid because I believe that I'm gifted in this calling. I'm gifted in this position. And I want you to know that God wants you to know that you need to keep on shooting and keep on trusting and keep on believing because as you keep on trusting and keep on, yes, you're going to miss it. Yes, you're going to miss it sometimes. Yes, it's not going to be perfect. But God is going to see you grow in your progress as you begin to be committed. Committed. Keep on moving that, 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 that thought because not only do we understand it was about convenience, but in the in the in the the Bible tells us that he put his knee over his seed. <sighs> How many people today live out of need over seed? And when I talk about seed, I'm talking about being the seed of Abraham. I'm talking about being the seed that God's called you. But people are living out of the need. The Bible says he sold his birthright for a bowl of lentils. He sold his inheritance. For Cheerios. And here's the key. You will never know your commitment until it's challenged. Until you have to make hard decisions in your life. And how many people know, you will, the, the, the Bible tells us that in, in, the, in the text, he said, when, he, when, when uh, Jacob was stewing the, the food and, 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 and cooking, he, and he asked him, he says, look, I'm about to die. Now, how many people know you're not going to die and, and if you're going to die, that bowl of soup is not going to save you. But listen to me. The enemy always exaggerates your situation to get you to live by sight and not by faith. The Esau syndrome is you're always letting your need uh, become over your seed. And today, he wants to magnify what you don't have. He always magnifies. And that's why you keep on living out of comparison. That's why you're always living out of exaggeration. You hear your language? Nobody. Everybody. I can't do this. I can't do that. I can't. And you always say, I wish I had this. I, I wish I, and you hear people all say, I wish I had this in, in my life. If I could just have a, have a, if I could just have a spouse, if I could just have a better job. No, the problem is not what you don't have. It's what you have not recognized what you do have. It's not what you don't have that's keeping you from where you are. It's what you don't see in the inside that you do have. And today, God wants you to understand that you got to break the scarcity mentality that thinks that because somebody else got the job, that God is limited in supply for your life. That if somebody else starts a business, that it causes you to be bankrupt. No, today, the understanding is, is that God's got more. And if he blesses my brother, he can also bless me because we serve a God of abundance today. We are not scarce. We are people of abundance. Talk to me, somebody. Every once in a while, I get the joy of being upgraded when I'm flying. And I, I love upgrades. Y'all act like you don't like upgrades. But I like upgrades. I like it. I like, I like it when I, I and, and you'll notice that first class people, they, they're not really moved by the situation. <laughs> because the truth of the matter is, no matter uh, how many people line up, the plane is not moving any faster. How many know we're all going to get there at the same time? But you'll see them start piling up on the line. Southwest is the worst because everybody's got a number. You know what I'm saying? And everybody's trying to get to an edge and get to cabin seats. Get the, get the, get the overhead cabin. Come on now. 
The reason why people are in line is because they believe that there's not enough storage space. They want to get in line because they want to make sure that they can put their overhead, their, their rollerboard on the overhead. Talk to me, somebody. They want to make sure that, that they got everything squared away. But, but when you understand first class, first class is not moved. Because in first class, they got plenty of space. I mean, they don't just get to put up their roller board. They put up their bags. They take off their jackets. They hang them up. They, when you go by them, they don't even look at you. you. You see them drinking orange juice, and you're just salivating. <laughs> you're just hoping for some peanuts, and they're getting all kinds of good stuff. Wow. And too many of us are living in economy when God has called us in first class. And I'm talking about not just a, a, a understanding the abundance that we serve a big God. And we understand that, that we don't have to sell our birthright for a bowl of soup. But we live out of our need. And most importantly, the saddest thing about Esau was he thought that there were shortcuts. He sold it. And then the text in the writer of Hebrews, Hebrews tells us, Hebrews tells us that he sought for repentance, but it was too late. Because you will either live a life of discipline or you will live a life of regret. He regretted. And here's the truth. God is a God of second chances, but he's not a God of second consequences. Did you hear what I said? Anytime that you, you think you can shortcut, there are no shortcuts. I hate to tell you this. There are no shortcuts with God. That's why the Bible says in the book of Galatians, God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that shall he reap. If you don't like your harvest, you got to change your sowing. Today, as a people of God, I don't want to be an Esau. I don't want to squander the inheritance. I don't want to miss out on the blessing of God. I want to be uh, identified as a child of the firstborn, a church of the firstborn. And today, we as a people, we need to recognize what, what the writer of Hebrews was saying when he said that you are the church of the firstborn. How many know the firstborn receives the double portion? If you know anything about Jewish customs and Jewish understanding, the firstborn received the double blessing. It was the firstborn that saw that the blessing of God was going to be upon them, not just for their rights, but for their responsibilities. And we need to know today as a people that God has called us to be the firstborn, that we're called to be the head and not the tail. We're called to be the people that have distinction in this room today. That God has given distinction that we are seated with him in heavenly places. But we're not seated to show off. We're seated to take on his mantle. And part of that means responsibility. And when we understand our mark, we will walk differently. That's why the writer says, be careful that you don't refuse to listen to the one who is speaking. The writer of Hebrews challenged us to obey Christ's words. And this is the most important. We need a most important thing. As children of the firstborn, as being marked, we are marked by obedience over sacrifice. We're marked to be obedient. Our obedience is a direct reflection of our understanding of God. Let me say that again. Our obedience is a direct reflection of our understanding of God. We need to understand God is not good because of what he does. God is good because he is. <laughs> and because God is good, God is good is because God is God. And when we understand that God is good and God is God, that when he asks of us to, to obey him, it's not to harm us. It's because he has what's best for us. How many know oh, to obey is the best way? For many of us in this room, we have failed to understand the goodness of God. God has not put his laws to, to hinder us. He's put his laws there to grow 
us and to mature us so that we can walk in what's best, that w- the best things he has for us. Are you getting what I'm saying? It, it just reminds me of a story, and, and if you have teenagers, you can relate because I've got teenagers. God help us all. I've got, I've got a 15-year-old. I've got an 18-year-old. And I got a 12-year-old. <sighs> Help me, Lord. And, and the story goes, uh, a father was talking to his son, and the son was asking the father to take his truck. Son wanted his daddy's truck because he wanted to take out his girlfriend in the truck. And, of course, like every good father, he told him no. I'm not taking my truck. You're not taking. I don't care what kind of truck it is for the Ford people, whatever Ford truck you think is amazing. If you're a Dodge person, whatever Dodge truck you think is amazing. If you're a Chevy, whatever. Toyota, as long as you're not pulling a Honda. I'm just messing. But then in the the story, he's like, no, you can't have it. And, and the son gave him attitude. Dad, you know I work so hard. Dad, you know this. Dad, you know that. Dad, you, man, if you, blah, 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 blah. I don't understand why you won't just let me have the truck, you know. Uh, don't you trust me. Don't you trust me. And the dad responded, said, son, have you ever missed a meal at our house? Have you ever missed me? No, Dad. No, no. Have you have you ever been harmed in this house? Have you ever been harmed and and, and felt that you are, your life was uh, in in jeopardy or or any, No, Dad. No. Have you ever had any? Have you had your, any of your needs not met? No, Dad. You have you? T- I've taken care of your clothes. You got clothes on your back. You got shoes on your feet. You're you're doing really well. I'm like, uh, has Dad not even met some of your wants? Yeah. I've, yeah, Dad. He, I, you've met some of wants. Okay. So the question is not do do I trust you? you but don't you trust me see when we understand that everything that comes from God is good and perfect then it's easy for us to obey it's easy for us to understand that God's God's ways are the best way for us and and it's out of that love and knowledge that we obey we don't obey out of duty we obey out of desire because we've got a good father and he, he said if your earthly father knows how to give good gifts how much more will your heavenly father give you the holy spirit we got a good father i don't know what you've gone through in life you may not have had a good dad here you may not have had a good parents you may not have had a good home life but can i tell you that your earthly father is nothing like your heavenly father your heavenly father is good your heavenly father is perfect your heavenly father is a provider your heavenly father Father is a healer. Your heavenly Father is a forgiver. Your heavenly Father is a redeemer. Even if you've gone as far as away and said, I, I reject God. God the Father, he loves you so much that he'll stand and look for you. And when you come, he'll put his arms around you because he's a good father. He'll restore what the canker worm and locusts have stolen. He's a God that can redeem you from the uttermost to the guttermost. That's the God that we serve. And that's why we obey him. We obey him because he's good. He's perfect in all of his ways. And not only do we recognize out of our obedience, our obedience comes out of that place, but we understand that we have responsibility. Our responsibility over our rights. Today, God has called us to operate under the responsibility of of the firstborn church. It's time we stop looking for gimme, 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 my name is Jimmy. If your name's Jimmy, I'm sorry. It's time we understand the responsibility that, that God has put a mantle on us and that mantle weighs on us that the blessing and the burden weigh the same. And there's a reason why God has put some burdens on you because there every time God gives a deposit, uh, he makes a demand. He didn't gift you uh, just so you could look clean. He didn't give you a good business uh, just so you could have the corner office. He didn't bless your family so you could have drip and Gucci and Versace. He 
bless you so you could be a blessing, so you could be a man and a woman of God that demonstrate the compassion of God and the love of God. He put some responsibility so that what he put in your hand, you would put it into practice for the glory of God, not for the glory of man, not the glory of self, not so you can get fame and, and fortune, but so that you can give glory and honor and praise because where he puts a deposit, he puts a demand. Come on, give the Lord a praise in this place. It's a sign of a blessing. Some of us are complaining about the thing God put on us. But it is a sign that we're blessed. It's a sign. You know, it's, so there's some stuff you've got to grow into this year. Because you will never know what's in you till God puts something on you. Woo! I want to grow. God gives you responsibility. I don't want that. I want God to use me. Here's the opportunity. I don't want that. Do you want to grow? I don't got anybody in this room who want to grow. I, I want to grow. I want to grow. And so it's just like kindergarten. You remember when your kids are in kindergarten and they put on the first day of school, they put on that little backpack and that backpack will be twice as big as them. You see them coming around and they'd be like, ooh, kind of leaning back. Little care again when she went into kindergarten. I mean, she only weighs, she still only weighs like 35 pounds and she's nine. You know what I'm saying? Like, she's so skinny. Like, uh, we keep on having to feed her because they, they, if not, people are going to start sponsoring her. She's just that kind of child. But, but, but I remember when she put on that little backpack and that little backpack, she'd be in there and we'd watch her. We'd walk her into school and then, and then all of a sudden, but isn't it amazing as she came at the end of kindergarten, uh, what was uh, on her uh, that was on her that looked like it was overwhelming her? She started growing into her backpack and that's exactly what God has put on you. He's given you some, put some stuff on you and it looks like it's too big for you. But can I tell you, you're going to grow into that. You're going to grow into that role. You're going to grow into that relationship. You're going to grow into that place. You're gonna grow because you recognize that he didn't put it on me to hurt me he put it on me so that I could grow this year he didn't put it on me so I could be fearful he put it on me because he believed the best for me and he put it on me so that I could be who everything that God has called me to be I'm going to grow this year just high five somebody said he's putting it on me today he's put it he's put a mantle on me so I can grow Woo. I'm growing and I'm growing in my responsibility. I'm, I'm growing in my servanthood. I'm growing in, in, my, in my role as a husband. I'm growing in my role as a father. I'm growing. He, uh, we're going through some stuff because he put it on me so he could grow me. See, God doesn't put stuff on you to grade you. He puts it on you to grow you. You hear me, what I'm saying. Some of you are complaining about what you're going through or, or what you've been put on your life. That's a sign that, he, that you're becoming a child of the, a church of the firstborn. That I, I can carry this. I know it's a little heavy right now, but I'm going to carry this. Because I know that he didn't put it on me so that I'd be overwhelmed. He put it on me so I'd strengthen my legs. So I'd begin to walk out this thing for the glory of God. I, I'm going to be responsible. This is the year that I stop making excuses and I start making effort because I'm going to be responsible. I'm going to take ownership of my life. I'm going to stop blaming people for where I am and begin to say, it's me, God. Because here's the thing. I'm going to be either unshakable or I'm going to be unstable. The writer of Hebrews says he's going to shake everything. He's going to shake everything that can be shaken. And unshakable means I'm steadfast. I'm unshakable. I'm like the Energizer Bunny. I take a licking, but keep on kicking. Come on, somebody. Come on. Come on, just stay with me right now. Unshakable. It's a sign of the firstborn. I'm here today and I'm going to be here tomorrow I'm not going to vacillate between situations Paul told the Corinthian church be steadfast immovable always abounding 
for your labor is not in vain. Mm -hmm. And can I just tell people in this room, and this is no pun, this is no hurt. If you're here for the first time, we're not trying to weigh you off, but can I tell you in every church, there are people that will start here, but they won't be here by the end of the year. Because they let things that happen to them get in them. Mm -hmm. And they get shook. But I'm an Israel. I'm not an Esau. Mm -hmm. Esau can sell his birthright, but I'm, I'm going to walk in my birthright. I'm not going to be shook. I'm not going to be shaken. I got a 2024 election. Oh, Lord Jesus, God. Lord, we got Donald Trump. Can I just keep it real? And I got Joe Biden. And, I, and, the, and the world is starting to talk about uh, elections and, and people start polarizing themselves. Well, I'm Democrat and I'm Republican. I'm neither. I don't follow the goat. I don't follow the donkey. And I don't follow the elephant. I follow the lamb. While you're looking left and you're looking right, I'm looking up. I'm not going to be shook by the election. Whoever the president is doesn't change that because I don't serve a God that is elected. I serve a God that sits high on the throne. And I'm not going to be shook by the situation. Oh, God. I'm not going to get shook this year by economies. I'm going to be faithful because my economy is not based on what the world is. See, see, I don't have donors. I, I have one. I got one source. One source. You didn't hear what I said. I got one source. I got one source. It may be supplied in different places, but I got one source. And if the river dries up, he'll send me to a widow woman. If the widow woman dries up, he'll open up the floodgate. I serve a God who's able to supply all of my needs according. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. I'm not sh shook by the economy. I got socks and bonds. They can go up and down. I don't care. My faith is not in the economy. My faith is not in my 401k. My faith is in the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. I wish I had a, a church that, that said, we're going we're gonna to be steadfast. I'm not serving for applause. If you clap for my preaching, praise the Lord. If you turn around and walk out the door, praise the Lord. I, I'm living for the one. See, God can't bless your yes until you grow your no. I'm not, what do I mean by that? I mean, for all of us, we're living for the pleasing of people or the pleasing of our own self. But I'm not living for that anymore. I can't. I can't live for people because it don't matter how much I do for you, you're still going to act the same way. Come on, no matter how much I try to help the family, it don't matter how much I try to help them, they still gonna do what they wanna do. You been, how about be a God pleaser this year? How about be a God pleaser this year? How, be, how about be a worshiper, not just on Sunday morning, but be a worshiper 24 hours a day. <laughs> I've come to worship you. Every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. Glory to God. I feel the presence of the Lord in this place. You see, I came into this place. Man, this brother is crazy. I, you came to the right house. Because you need somebody that won't just give you a three-point sermon and walk you walk out the same way. You need a word that'll shape your life. You need somebody that'll challenge you and grow you from faith. It's time for us to get off the milk and start beginning to chew on God's word. It's time for us to stop letting the airplane try to feed us and start beginning to rightfully divide the word of truth. This is a year we're going to grow. And you say, Pastor, today, I don't know God. Can I tell you today, when you surrender your life for Jesus he doesn't make you second class. He makes you firstborn immediately. That's right. He makes you firstborn. And his spirit begins to steward you. So you'll begin to grow into your inheritance. So you'll grow into the walk that he has for you. And can I tell you today, this will be the perfect day to surrender your life to God. With every head bowed and every eye closed, no one looking around. You say, that's me, Pastor. I want to surrender my life to Jesus. Just raise your hand right now. Come on. Come on, come on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. 
Oh, Jesus, I want you to pray this prayer with me. I say, Jesus, today, with all the church, say, Jesus, today, I surrender my life. I ask you right now to forgive me of my sins. I've sinned against you. I've sinned against myself. And I've sinned against others. And I ask you not only to clean, cleanse me, but to come into my life. I turn away from sin and I turn to you and I ask you to be my savior and I make you my Lord. From this day forward, I choose to follow you. I give you my life. Thank you, Jesus. And all God's people said, come on, would you give the Lord a praise right there? Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. If you prayed that prayer, Come on, it wasn't the words, it was the faith behind it. Come on, would you give God some praise today? How many people in this room are ready to give God their best in 2024? How many are ready to go to another level today? Come on, I've come to worship Him. Come on, I've come to give Him praise today. I've come to grow. I'm going to be the church of the firstborn. I'm going to be marked by generosity. I'm going to be marked by obedience. I'm going to be marked by maturity.